when you have a specific goal in mind, to combine a digital to an analog converter that circumvents convention, an amplifier that performs to an extraordinarily high level, and a preamp that is supposed to be of the same caliber as its counterparts in a chassis that is small, beautiful, well-constructed, well-designed, ergonomic, there will be a price tag to attach. From Rob Watts and Cord comes the review of the Cord TT2. Special thank you to my friend Mo for dropping this device here for review. Let's talk. The current price point of this unit stands at £4,250, $6,000 US basically, and a uh, million dollars in Australian dollars. Um, the price is very hefty, but what you have to consider is the fact that this unit combines everything that you might need in a closed setup system for your desk. Maybe you find yourself with very little desk space but you want the best. Maybe you find yourself not wanting a rack of equipment, or maybe you want the aesthetics, the build quality, and the sound quality. So you'll come to this, the Core TT2. Shall we do a hardware tour? I think we should. Okay, let's proceed with a hardware tour of this unit. This sandwiched machined aluminium via CNC is absolutely immaculate. It feels so premium. Probably one of the most beautiful audio devices I have ever seen and that has come through the channel. I'm sorry Hollow, I love your products but the sheer size of the things you produce. I am enamored by this. I mean look at the, the writings etched. Let's see if we pick this up like this. The writing is etched so beautifully. Every contour of the shapes that have been cut out of this aluminium is not sharp, but it dips and folds around itself, just like around the volume, which we will get onto in a second. And this doesn't just apply to the top and the edges, but to the front. The circumference of the buttons is sloping outwards in a gentle curve as well right here, all the way there. And then as we come to the front and then round the back, we have four feet underneath and we have all the connections at the back. There is a piece of plastic here. This is to let the antennas through for the Bluetooth uh, capability for ease of use, wonderful. We have this viewing window of the inside up top and everything changes colors as to every cord product out there. Basically the color of the rainbow, if you don't know that, um, talk to your kids or talk to your nephew or niece or something and let them teach you the song because this basically follows that red and yellow and green and blue, blah, 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 blah. Um, so yes. We start off with a menu button on the left hand side of the unit as it's facing you, right as it's facing you now. Um, and then we have a select button next to it and then we have the standby button and then we come to this side, we have a 3.5 jack. Now, what they've done is cut out a line underneath so that if you've got right angle jacks, it will slot in there and sit flush with the system. A bit irritating when you're unplugging, but when you're plugging it in, it's wonderful. And then two 6.3 jacks in the front. And as we jump to the other side of the unit, we have a galvanically isolated USB-B connection, a pair of optical inputs, a pair of connections via B and C. This is for a future cord product. And at the moment, there's been no news about that. So we can forget about that because there's absolutely no use for it right now. A pair of balanced XLR outputs and a pair of RCA straddling the balanced outputs. Apparently they've been separated for their own good because I've got a feeling they like causing trouble. A pair of BNC connection, Uno and DOS for the M scaler and the upsampling. A pair of optical inputs and USB-B galvanically isolated for isolation. And as we turn the unit back around, yoink, yeeting it across the desk. 
Oh, this thing is so beautiful. So beautiful. Wanna buff it? Such a beautiful device. Um, we have the volume knob at the front. It's this ball which changes color as you go up the volume scale, obviously starting with off and then red and then going up the rainbow scale as usual. So, built exceptionally well. One of the most beautiful audio products I have ever picked up and I'm just enamored by it. Let's talk about its features and its functions. Starting with USB, this unit can support up to 768 kHz. Optical is capped at 192 as usual. The BNCs can be upscaled into the M scaler up to 768 kHz from a Redbook CD quality. But for now, we're going to be taking this review of the unit by itself. So you can connect this unit by a variety of different connections. One, two, three, four, dash five, if you're using both BNC connections with a cord product like the M scaler. Absolutely wonderful. But the majority of the review has been done on this unit via a single BNC, dual BNC with the, the M scaler and optical for a little bit of testing. And obviously USB has been the main input. Features and functions of the unit, as I turn this around. So as we go through the unit, we can access cross feed, filters, the amplifier with pre or just DAC mode, brightness level, etc. And then we can set these settings via the set button according to our preference. It's a nice system, but it's rather irritating when you have to go one, two, three, four, five, six to just to go to the input selection and go USB, optical, coax, etc. That is really annoying. And for that reason, they have provided. Where are you? Here. The cheapest most horrible, nasty remote control that probably costs like a pound from China. This is akin to the top-in products which cost like a hundred or two hundred pounds. I am ashamed of your cord. This is a travesty. This is disgraceful. This is, there is just no excuse for a unit that sometimes could be put into a rack with the M scaler and the Toby power amplifier so that you can use it at a distance to have something like this. This thing is going to last a couple of months tops. I have nothing but bad things to say about the remote control. Its functionality and its layout is wonderful though. You've got access to the cross feed, you've got access to the filters, you've got access to a volume control and all the inputs, everything is perfectly laid out and useful on the remote itself. It just needed to be machined out of a CNC block of aluminium like this, like the hollow audio remote, so that you can actually feel special touching it. You know, the funny thing is, it's easier to use this for the uh, cross feed and for the filters and stuff and for volume control. And yet, I always wanted to reach out touch this beautiful unit and actually interact with the unit just so that I can give this a nice little pat. I think I'm going to get a restraining order from it because I've been fondling it quite a lot and I think it's getting pissed off with me. This unit can output 18 watts out of the balanced XLR outputs at the back. So you can actually go into amp mode and be able to control the pre and still connect a pair of headphones via a non-conventional three pin XLR left and three pin XLR out or get an adapter from my buddy Skedra over at Viking Weave. He can make you a pair of XLR three pins into a four pin XLR female so you can connect your headphones to it. You don't need it for most headphones. You don't need it in fact for 99.9% .9 of headphones unless you have a Sesvara. And that is a whole different story which we will get onto about headphone comparisons on this unit later on. The front jacks can output 7.3 watts at 300 ohm and obviously like we stated through the balance at the back we've got 18 
watts into eight ohms. So you can drive efficient passive speakers with the outputs at the back. You can drive 99.9% .9 of headphones at the jacks at the front. We have two 6.3 and a 3.5 for your IEM. And not only this, but you can simultaneously, like the Sennheiser HDVD 800 and 820, run all headphones simultaneously. Now this concept is a bit risky, putting three sets of headphones on this unit simultaneously, because if you've got a pair of IEMs connected to the 3.5 and you have a pair of one easy to drive and one hard to drive headphones like a Verite closed, like this beauty here, which most of our review will concentrate on this synergy, because it's one of the best systems I have ever heard, period. You'll have three sets of different variations of volume for those three headphones simultaneously because you can't mute individual ones. I wish there was like three buttons here so you can mute them and isolate them specifically and then click on those so that you can actually use those specific headphones as use case dictates. Also, plugging in headphones and unplugging headphones is another chore on this amplifier, which we will get onto in the caveat section. There are a couple of quirks that I am not fond of. The display on this unit will state what crossfeed and what filters you're using and what inputs, etc. except the sample rate and volume, which are indicated via the ball and via the color scheme. This unit is powerful. This unit is beautiful. This unit is functionally ergonomic at a desk. This unit's expensive. But if you are an individual who loves nothing but music and who's not a gearhead, who doesn't care about racks upon racks of equipment as if they're in a studio, there isn't a single unit on the market right now that can match the TT2 and the M scaler. And this is four years old now. It is absolutely divine. And I think that brings us nicely to the sound characteristics of the Chord TT2. I have tested a variety and a large amount of amplifiers on the channel, off and on camera. And there are a few pieces of equipment that completely fade into the background despite how beautiful they are and just mesmerize you by their sonic characteristic. The Verite Closed from ZMF, review somewhere up here if it's been released, and the TT2 and the M scaler have been some of the best systems I have ever heard for headphones, period. That includes Spring 3, Benchmarks and Sesvaras. It is some of the most seductive, soul grabbing, musical, synergizing systems money can buy. What makes this TT2 so versatile is one of its functions. Two, in fact, the filters and the crossfeed. The crossfeed, in simple layman's terms, will feed some of the left channel into the right and some of the right channel into the left to give you more of a speaker esque experience. Because when we're sitting in front of a 2.1 or a 2.2 channel system, our left ear does not shut off the right speaker and our right ear does not shut off the left speaker. Our left ear hears both, our right ear hears both. And this is what this function is attempting to do. A lot of amplifiers have done this in the past and I have despised it. I can't stand it. In fact, even on this unit, the maximum setting, there is one, two and three settings for this. Minimal, moderate and maximum, though the names are slightly different. The minimal is nice. The moderate is wonderful. The maximum sounds fake to my ears personally. So it's always been left on after the testing phase and the review phase on the middle one, moderate. And then something else to add sprinkled sugar to the cake is the filters. If you're familiar with the Chord Cutest, you'll find the same familiarity here too. You have filter one to filter four. Filter one is the reference, it's flat, 
So most of the testing was done via crossfeed off and filter one, obviously. And then for my subjective tastes, for my own pleasurable listening, it's filter four. Warm with some DSP correction in the treble region. And that setup config with a verite closed almost mitigates the need for a tube amplifier. It's warm, yet without being overly soft. It's expansive without losing the borders of the stage. It's defined. Every instrument floating in the air in a 360 degrees holographic imaging config without being overly busy. The sense of space and depth of this unit is mesmerizing. I find it has not worked well with all headphones though. The Focal Stellia is not a good synergy with a Chord TT2. It's overly soft for some reason and it just sounds non-engaging. But every other headphone I have tested on this VC, Elite, Lyric, Fostex 909s, oh my god, I should have taken those headphones out because it's just, oh, it's just, it's just, it's just. Let's talk about the unit and dissect it piece by piece. Starting with the DAC, inside the unit, on and off. So the DAC in this unit, when not placed with the M scaler, is actually very resolving, within the unit itself. Because there is a difference there between using its own amplifier and taking that DAC out. I think you lose a hell of a lot of performance. But while you're using the unit as a whole, it's concisive, it's quick, due to Rob Watt's pulse array and the transience response. It's technical, it's fast, it has the capability to reproduce extremely busy, heavy tracks like the Hans Zimmer's Pirates of the Caribbean Live, which is one of my hardest test tracks, and show every instrument within the space without it overshadowing other instruments around it. Rob Watt's philosophy is, I am not trying to create a DAC. I am trying to give you a reproduction of the analog signal that was broken apart into its digital config so that it could be transported elsewhere. I am trying to stitch back together the samples with the perfect timing so that everything aligns and you get the story of the artist from the studio. Because this is a different philosophy to other manufacturers, I believe. We will never know what the artist intended. We will most certainly not know how that track was recorded in the studio. And we will most definitely not know what the hell was in the engineer's mind when he decided to place everything together. Because the post-production of tracks is just ridiculous. But if we can recreate a song, a completed song, with perfect transience and timing, maybe we can get somewhere close to that whole story. So the whole concept of chasing the dream of what the artist intended is a fallacy. So the DAC is very capable in this unit. I would say it's on par with a Spring 3 when it's inside the unit itself. But when you take the DAC out of the unit, and I've thrown it on my forum stack on the OR, it's mediocre at best and I don't understand why. Is it due to the fact the amplifier is such high resolution and capable in this unit? We can't test that with another DAC unfortunately. Though this is a unit which is stating it's an amplifier, it's a DAC and it's a pre, it really isn't. It's an amplifier for its own DAC, it's a pre for its own DAC, and it's a power amp for its own DAC. You can't uncouple 
those specific elements of the chain that's been put into this unit to identify each one. But what we can do is take the DAC out of the unit to isolate the other two components and make a educated guess. Because I believe what's happening within the unit from the DAC to the amplifier through the circuitry inside is far more important than we first assumed. The signal path from the DAC to the output stage to the amplifier has far less barriers in this unit than when we put the DAC through another amplifier because we lose a tremendous amount of resolution, staging and imaging. In my experience, if you have different experiences, please let me know down below. And this applies to this DAC being used on the OR and on my studio monitors behind me. But the amplifier inside this, which we will jump onto now, has got wonderful stage, superb clarity, excellent imaging, and it's blazingly fast. Yet everything is delivered with a smooth, beautiful texture where nothing sounds sharp. And it's not polite either. It's got the authority and the power when it needs it, when you use the unit by itself. I was not uh, overly impressed with the pre though. The, I think my gold point back there, stepped attenuator, is far more transparent. This didn't sound too referent in the pre section to my ears. I find my gold point is far more transparent. So I did take the DAC out of this um, through the XLRs at the back. It's a 2.5 fixed voltage output and uh, going into my passive gold point stepped attenuator and into my studio monitors, um, I found it a bit lacking compared to just my gold point uh, from the benchmark DAC3 back there. Um, when you go to variable, uh, you find that you've got the voltage up to 3.5. So the voltage does go up when you use the pre rather than fixed DAC out. So that gives you an overall picture of the amplifier and the DAC and the pre. But how does it perform altogether? What are its characteristics that have made me so fall in love with this? And especially with the Verite Closed. For that, let me paint you a picture. Though exceptionally beautiful for EDM and superbly quick and superb transient response, this unit sings to me when you're playing beautiful songs with a story. Taking a track from Catatonia, the Swedish metal band, not the Australian singer, or taking a track from Hans Zimmer. You are presented with a recording space, a live environment, or an intimate show. The vocalist is right up and center, and you can hear the reverberations around her voice. It seems to bounce off the walls around her, and it doesn't cascade into the distance. The space between you and her is the equivalent of you sitting three rows back. And you gaze at her, and it's as if you can make eye contact with a singer. It's as if you can see the impressions on her face. The pairing with the Verite Closed has just been mind-blowing. So much so, I can easily give up Sasvara's. Not because it's better than Sasvara's, but because it captures my soul. You fade into the background. When there's an attack of a drum, you feel it. But it's not separate to everything else and all the other elements within the track. Loud noises are loud. Quiet noises are subtle. And neither blurs each other out. It's a gentle presentation of a track. It reminds you that the equipment means nothing. If the song is good, if it's well recorded, in fact, it's actually pretty good for badly uh, mixed tracks as well, to be honest, because it's, it's forgiving. It's forgiving in a good way. 
You feel present with a singer. It's captivating. Even if you can't afford the chord stack, I advise go into a can jam, go into a audition room and sit in with it. And sit in with a verite closed if you can get one because the synergy between these two has been mesmerizing. And just get a couple of hours auditioning with this unit. So let's break down the frequency response. The unit has the capability of touching the lowest of low sub bass notes. Everything is very well defined. Every bass instrument is very well defined. And the resonance that it reproduces and the edge of attack pops. So that when you're listening to a singular bass track, every nuance of the fretboard, the housing of the instrument is presented to you. This is the combination of the reproduction of the DAC, the FPGA topology, and the resolution of the amplifier within the unit itself. It powers every part of the frequency response with a perfect amount of voltage, just so that everything's beautifully presented without it being harsh, sibilant, or overshooting. The skins and textures of drums is wonderful. When you get to the mid bass, you get authoritative punch from the kick drum, wonderful attack. Yet, you've got the depth to see it ahead of you. It's not too close, but it has the capability to come laterally, forward to back, and even up and down. There's a wonderful sense of space, a very, very big sense of space. As we climb up to the upper bass region, um, this is where a lot of amplifiers and DACs kind of fail at times. Sometimes we believe it might be due to the headphone drivers, but uh, the amp and the DAC does play a big role. And no, it's very authoritative and it's very weighty and it's very organic as well. So that the upper bass region just smoothly rises. The frequency response of the amp, if you can define it as such, is a very smooth linear rise. It's, it's a beautiful neutral when you don't use the filters presentation. You get a pitch black background and every instrument pops within the stage holographically. Mid range is neither overly emphasized nor discordant in any part of the frequency response from the lower to the mid to the highs. It's a very beautiful presentation. There is absolutely no discourse in the upper mid-range region either. And treble region, uh, for some amplifiers, it's a little bit forward, like my ore. It is a little bit tilting in the treble region, unfortunately. Um, it can become a bit tiring after a couple of hours. Um, depending on what headphones you use, but with that can be mitigated obviously with the voltage as we will get onto that review. With this, it's just perfect. There are a few hardware issues with this unit, but sonically, I can't fault the TT2. Okay, what happens when you throw that three and a half thousand pound M scaler on this and turn it into a 9.5K system. When you add the M scaler via BNC, dual BNC data cable on this unit, a special thank you to Jez for lending us the M scaler. It's a night and day difference without needing to AB. The stage, how big it is, expands tremendously. The resolution goes up dramatically. Every element of sound seems to float in the air. In fact, it's so bad putting the M scaler on the TT2. <laughs> when you take it away, it feels like there's something missing. There is something very, very big missing. Um, my friend Mo came over who lent us this unit for the review and he's owned the TT2 for quite a while. So he's very familiar with it. I said, do you need to hear the TT2 first? We've showed him the TT2. He had to listen to a track on the Lyric. And then I said, okay, let's put the M scaler on now. And he just went, oh my God, it's that kind of difference. It's instantaneous. It's immediately audible. 
transparency of instruments. The way they're reproduced seems to just come alive and pop. It's basically this amplifier on steroids, and I think if you own this, you can be very happy. It's beautiful, it's wonderful. But down the road, when you save up enough money and you want to get the M scaler, you're going to take it to a whole new level. It's the speed and the attack that improves. It's the edge of instruments that improves. It's the spatial presentation and the stage that improves. And yet the tonality is still the same and it's still the same characteristics. It's just been pushed to its limits. It's freaking wonderful. So what headphones did we use with this? Like I stated in the beginning, we've had the Lyric here, the Fostex 909s, the Elite, the beautiful Verite closed Ironwoods. Thank you, Grant, you're a legend. The thing behind me, the Focal Stelia, and the Sesvaras. Sesvaras is not designed for this unit. It's, you get a nice mid-range, but that's it. It can't drive this headphone. So Sasvara was a no-go. After the first 10 minutes, I said, no, this, let's just put this aside. Those, those are such freaky, 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 freaky headphones. We just said, nah. The Lyrique and the VC might be some of the best pairing I've heard with this unit. It's soul grabbing. You fade away into the song. The Focal Stelia was not a good experience on this. It was overly mushy and it was overly soft and everything was just, Okay, am I done now? Can I stop listening to this? I keep reaching for the VC, the Fostex 909s, and the Lyric with this unit. The Fostex 909s gives you this beautiful, ultra high resolution treble region. It's very treble focused. So if you do like treble in a smooth manner with as much detail as you want, Holy hell, those headphones on this unit is incredible. The articulation, the transparency, the clear glass window into the mix is wonderful. I just don't like the bass region on the Fostex 909s personally. I think it's a little bit overly bloated. Those are a V taper headphone and um, I even on this unit, I mean, it's fine for real instruments. It's fine for a few instruments, but um, it's not, really nice for overly busy tracks. I don't like it, but the treble region is God on this unit. Absolutely. So we've actually gushed over this unit enough. Let's talk about the caveats. And there is quite a few. First and foremost, the lack of a 4.4 or a four pin XLR in the front for convenience sake is really annoying. 99% of our true flagship headphones come all with balanced 4-pin XLRs or Pentacon, and this doesn't have that. So you either have to go single-ended or adapter, which basically means new cables or find an adapter to go out of the back, which is irritating as hell. I'm not happy about that. I've put up with it. I'm not happy about it, but that's not the worst. Due to the chipset inside this for the amplifier, the high capacitors, they need to charge and discharge every time you do something, like unplug in a headphone or plug in a headphone. It's a 15 second relay click switch over, which discharges the voltage, I presume, and recharges it. So as a reviewer, when testing multiple headphones, you can imagine this would be a freaking nightmare. Plug headphones in, wait 15 seconds, comes back on, take headphones off, try something else, wait another 15 seconds. It's been a freaking nightmare for that. So I've had to limit it to proper listening sessions per headphone before switching. That delay, it's just, it's just annoying. When this DAC amplifier pre-combo is in DAC mode, you've connected a pair of headphones, it cuts off the outputs at the back, go into your studio monitors or speakers, etc. This is a very good thing. But when you unplug the headphones, it takes another 15 seconds for those to come back online and vice versa. So this is a bit irritating. The menu system, uh, unless you're using this uh, cheapo remote, is very annoying for switching inputs. It's a bit of a nightmare. So if you are somebody who's got USB, coax and optical all in simultaneously because you've got a variety of systems on the go going through this, 
uh, it's a bit of a nightmare switching from one to the other. You really do have to rely on this. So I recommend buying two or three of these because you know they're gonna break. And the switch mode power supply not being inside the unit, it's good if you wanna replace it. I've been wanting to try the Hypsos power supply with this. I've not had the adapter yet. I wanna see if it makes a difference. Um, and obviously I'm not gonna do that with this unit, but with a unit of my own, because I think I want to buy one. I think I want this system on my desk. I love it that much, quite honestly. Um, possibly, if money and time allows, we'll see. I'm just enamored with it. I think I'm more in love with the design <laughs> than anything else. I just love the look of this thing. Um, apart from that, I think the, those few things are my only gripes, really. Sonically, this thing is absolutely exceptional and it's the best thing you're gonna get in this footprint. It's ridiculously good. So let's give it the Tiger scores, shall we? Build quality, five Tigers out of five. Feature set, three Tigers out of five because the lack of 4.4 uh, and a four pin is a detriment to me and the switching of things taking 15 seconds is a detriment, so three out of five Tigers for that. Sonic quality, five tigers out of five. Price to performance ratio, I'm gonna give this five tigers out of five because I've not found anything else that performs on this level. That's this foot footprint, that's this beautiful, and that's this easy to use. It just works. It's an Apple device, it just works. You put it on your desk, it's tiny, and it will, unless you've got a Sasvara, drive anything perfectly, wonderfully. You've got a myriad of connections. And I love the look of it. It looks like it was taken out of a spaceship from Roswell or something. It, it's absolutely stunning. I think if you don't like the look of this, you are allowed to be completely wrong, but you're wrong. Don't at me. So overall, I'm going to give this a solid four tigers out of five, if you can afford it. Um, if not, please go and hear it from my audition room at least and uh, get to experience this wonderful system. I can't speak any higher praise about this than I have already for the last half an hour. It's wonderful, especially with a VC. With a VC, it's God, literally God tier. I hope you permit me to uh, talk to you about Patreon. Um, our Patreon is in place so that we can pay our editor, Bitwolf, to edit these videos for you, and to our cameraman, Jamie, who does all our B-rolls and who's just a wonderful guy. And all of this money obviously goes out of pocket. So if you would like to support the channel, you get early reviews, access to the private Telegram chat, and access to me via voice where we can discuss all of these units as they come in on the fly for hot takes, etc. And I would like to extend a massive thank you to Ahabu for being my Jungle King tier. You're wonderful. Thank you for the support. It's very, very much appreciated. And to all of you for following us on this journey. I will see you next time. Stay safe. Peace.